best restaurant in Linwood. Yeah, so, yeah, I do. I do. I do. Yeah, 
Make sure you guys find your drinks, find your seats, say hi to the person next to you. I know it's a little bit tight in here. And we will be starting in just a moment, all right?
lot of people. I, who's here new tonight? Yeah, a lot of people. Awesome, guys. So, uh, welcome. We're see and learn, and uh, we're going to be getting underway in just a moment. So, yeah, so uh, I got some bad jokes that I can tell you guys. No. It's too late. All right, blame Glenn this guy. Okay, he brought it on us. All right, so. No, football scores? No, no, no. Okay, so. Baseball scores. A lot of you guys are probably scuba divers, right? Raise your hand if you've ever scuba dove. Right? So you guys probably know that scuba is an acronym. Did you know that? What does it stand for? Something came underwater breathing after right? Okay, so did you know that tuba is also an acronym? It stands for terrible underwater breathing after Oh, that was funny! Thousand comedians out of work, and you still try. Exactly. <laughs> hey, maybe I'm the next one. Who knows? Trying to warm up the crowd for the headliner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta start low, so you guys will be blown away. Right? I can't start too high. Yeah. Um, so, uh, in case I ever get famous, my name is JJ from South Carolina. Um, where are you guys coming from? Today? Yeah. Um. South Carolina? <laughs> Another one of you. Where? Where? Charleston, where are you Charleston, from? Uh, like Myrtle's Inlet, Myrtle Beach? No kidding. Yeah, yeah. what about anybody Washington else from the US? Washington, D.C.? Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. Sweet. Yeah, yeah. Who is coming from the furthest away? Who thinks like from Sabo? <laughs> <laughs> Not too far. Uh, Netherlands? Netherlands, yeah. Uh, anybody from like Indo-Pacific? Netherlands is here. Alaska. <laughs> uh, Canada. 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 I mean, what? No. <laughs> What's that? You know, uh, I have to say this. We're from Nova Oh, really? From where? Nova Kofi. Never heard of it. You'll have to show me sometime. He has to pronounce it correctly uh -huh. first. Oh, how do you pronounce it? Nova Kofi. Nova Kofi? Yeah. It's, not spelled, it's not spelled that way, but... Canada somewhere. Canada is just kind of a big, icy... You know, there's Yeti, you can make foot, you know. All right. Okay, we're ready. You guys are going to get to see that lovely video one more time, all right? All right, guys. So as you know, we are See and Learn going on for, I think, 18 years. Is that right? 18 years. Not consecutive because of COVID, obviously. But uh, yes, the 18th See and Learn. And we're bringing some awesome speakers to you guys tonight. You have not one but two speakers here tonight. So if you missed last time, you actually get to taste a little bit of that speaker. Um, unfortunately, we could not go on the sunset snorkel because of some rough weather conditions that were out there, but luckily, Dr. Edie Witter has uh, agreed to come on up here and still show you guys a little bit about what you might see out there. So maybe if you go next time or sign up for a sea snorkel, you know, these guys are always out there. So without further ado, can I get a big round of applause for Dr. Edie Witter?
Thank you very much. So for those of you that missed Friday night, um, my passion is bioluminescence. And we were supposed to go out for a night snorkel um, last night and see, see fireflies. And I just wanted to share with you a little bit of what you might have seen and what you could still see if you can arrange a night snorkel. And I would love to hear from any of the divers in the group. Hi, guys. Uh, <laughs> um, about what it's like out there, because when, when we went in 2012, the, which was the last time I was in Sabo, it was spectacular, and it's kind of an indicator of the health of the local waters, because uh, there used to be these sea fireflies everywhere throughout the Caribbean. They used to be all up and down the Florida Keys. They're completely gone now, pretty much wiped out from pollution. Um, and I don't think they've ever been studied at all around Sabo, so even just being able to look at what kind of patterns you see. so. This is what a beach looks like when it's, it's that's not dinoflagellates, that's actually sea fire, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's, that's sea fireflies. And you can tell the difference between that and when dinoflagellates are up, because you can see the individual point sources and then kind of this smearing in between. So the critters that are responsible for that are, are called sea fireflies, but they're actually a kind of crustacean uh, that's about the size of a sesame seed, and uh, they are um, actually ostracods, uh, and very cute, cool little creatures that have this amazing mating display, which is why they're called sea fireflies, because they use their light output just the way that fireflies do on land to attract a mate. But it's an interesting trick to use light to attract a mate, because you've got to worry about you're also going to attract a predator, right? So um, being able to make your light display and leave it behind you is a very clever trick. So a lot of these animals will come out of the reef or the seagrass meadows or the bottom. So when we were out in 2012, we just saw them come straight out of the sand. And you'd see, the first thing you saw about 15 minutes after sunset was you start to see a, a spot every now and then in the sand, and then they started to come up out of the sand. And the, the display pattern is species specific. So this is what's called a vertical shortening pattern, which is uh, specific to a particular species. This is a horizontal pattern. This is um, group sex. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they, the males actually coordinate their flashes to be able to attract a female. So the female of this species knows if she goes to the head of this line, she's gonna be able to find a male of her species. And it's astonishing how much light these little guys put out. Oh, the video's not, oh, maybe if I push it again. No, the video's not running. Okay, um, so they put out an astonishing am amount of light. And they can put out just a stream of the light, or they can squirt it out with a little blob of mucus. And so um, the, the male swims out, and he squirts out the, the two chemicals, luciferin and luciferase, inside a little blob of mucus. And then he swims a little higher and does it again and again and again. And it produces this amazing effect, um, this vertical uh, uh, shortening displays or all of these other types of displays. And there's now cameras that can capture this and for a long time. I mean, even back in 2012, it was pretty hard to have a camera system that, that could um, capture this. But just one little anecdote I wanted to share. Um, during World War II, ja the Japanese used to harvest ostracods. They'd just put a fish head off the dock, and it would attract a lot of ostracod scavengers, and they'd bring them up in a net and spread them on the dock, dry them in the sun. And uh, then Japanese soldiers would carry a vial of these dried, dead ostracods with them in the field. And if they needed to read a map at night and they didn't want to use a light that might be seen from the air, they'd pour some in their hand, spit on their hand, rub it around, and there'd be enough light to read a map by. And some of that same luminescence has been used a lot in biomedical research um, because it requires a cofactor um, calcium. Uh, so it, it's been helpful in, in learning how calcium um, systems work inside cells. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to share that, and I'd love to hear from any of you that go out night diving if you see any of these guys, because it should be year-round, right after sunset. Yeah. yeah. So, the green park, you know, something on the second Sunday of May, and we saw uh, a and we haven't seen any past six or seven weeks, and that's how long we've been doing it. So, at what 
time, so at, it's fully dark? And you haven't seen them? Oh, she, she was saying that they've been just uh, going out the last six weeks swimming across the sand flats, and um, they haven't seen any. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't even remember where we, we went in 2012. Do you? Okay. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm leaving at the crack of dawn tomorrow morning. <laughs> but that's, that's why I wanted to share this with people so that, um, I, and I really would like to hear about it if anybody sees any of it. With the moon cycle, the dogma is that it's year round. Um, you certainly see it better on the dark of the moon, and whether the animals uh, tend to display more on the dark of the moon uh, is not actually been shown. A lot of the work that's been done on this has been done in Belize, um, uh, Panama, um, but I don't know of any scientific studies that have been done around here. Evie, if we can interject, since you've been here in 2012, we've regularly promoted this as part of our nightlife, as part of our weekly slideshow. So yes, we do see it. Oh, you do see it? Absolutely. Okay, well that's great. Well, um, it was mentioned earlier that I, I, I just had a bu book published, a memoir, and chapter two begins with um, snorkeling in Saba to see, see fireflies and telling people that they need to come and see this um, while they still can. So I'd like to know that it had actually helped promote tourism for Saba and more appreciation for the ocean in general. So that would be great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, absolutely. Lynn is right. Um, I think it was 2015, 2016. We were notified that we, we could see these, so we went on the night dive. Uh, we just go down, we turn on off our lights, and wait. And it's it's a very unique stair step. Yes. Uh, that they do, and they're they're all over. Yeah. They're all over. No, it's spectacular. So the the. Um, the very different types of displays allows for crowding. You can have multiple species in the same area and they don't get confused because they have such distinctive patterns. That, that's the evolutionary reason for that. So I'm I, uh, really looking forward to Erica's talk tonight, which is another way to go and observe the ocean um, with ROVs. And as I said, now we've got cameras that um, can see bioluminescence, which was not possible in the early days when I was diving. Um, so I think you're going to be wowed. <laughs> and who do I turn this back to? JJ? <laughs>presentation here tonight would not be possible without a lot of help and support both from people here on the island and people all over the world so we're going to take a moment to thank them uh first carib trans is who sponsors the live streaming for this event so it's not just going to you guys but to people all over the world uh and juliana's hotel is sponsoring erica tonight so um we big thank you to them for hosting her uh, we have a huge thank you to the Prince Bernhard Culture Funds and to Public Entity SABA. They allow a lot of this to go on. Now, we also have a bunch of other sponsors. Again, most of these are from the islands, uh, so locals here that just really see the value in the program. So thank you to all of you guys out there, um, and Brigadoon especially, who is hosting this here tonight. Now, uh, we do have those raffle prizes. I know uh, we were talking about them a little bit earlier. This one in the middle, that is Edie's new book. So you could win a signed copy of that. And in chapter two, I believe, it actually talks about Saba and where she uh, saw those ostracods. So that is awesome. There's a uh, indigo blue wrap that you could win, uh, some jewelry, some nice gift baskets. Uh, Joe Bean is a glass maker. She has a whole class that you can take, actually make your own glass beads. There is an eight day fully paid for live aboard for scuba diving. So that is an awesome one that you can get. Or a lot of different cottages and villas that are offering three night stays. So those are uh, well over $1,000 for those um, uh, 
prizes, so definitely something to consider. The SCF is sponsoring a guided hike, and Lynn's husband, John, is making a knife, a homemade knife to give away as well. So lots of cool stuff. Definitely buy some of these prizes out here. Just some upcoming stuff that we have going on the rest of the week. Uh, tomorrow night, you can actually learn to build an ROV with Erica herself, so that is pretty awesome. Uh, our next speaker that we have coming in is going to be Elska and Renud. They are speaking Tuesday at Eco Lodge. It's going to be a big, big night. Lots of viewers online. So definitely come out, support us, and uh, come hear their talk. And then they're also going to a volcano monitoring site uh, that is right here on the island, which monitors Mount Scenery. So if you want to learn more about the place that you're staying at, it's definitely a cool thing to come out to. Sign up for everything at the Sea and Learn tent. Uh, that's where we will be all day. So, yeah. Without further ado, tonight we have Erica Moulton. So, everybody, big round of applause and a warm welcome as she talks to you about her. Now, Erica Moulton, um, have you ever wondered what kind of technology it takes to explore the ocean? It's not as easy as just swimming to the bottom. There's a lack of breathable oxygen, increasing pressure, and almost no sunlight that is down there. Now, luckily, our speaker tonight, Erica, she loves to teach anyone and everyone about how to explore. Her love of education uh, has taken her many places, even to the Arctic, to teach people about exploration. Now, she is a marine scientist, educator, adventurer, and maker with more than 20 years of experience in environmental education. She's the director of St. Petersburg College STEM Center and of her own nonprofit, Center for Open Exploration. She is soon to be indoctrinated into the Explorers Club, which is a huge <laughs> monumental uh, step yeah. for someone. And uh, she runs PVC ROV, which you guys are going to hear a little bit about. It's a small business that's d dedicated to teaching others about building underwater robotics. And if you go to that field project tomorrow night, you can actually experience that with her. Now, without further ado, I present to you the ROV MVP herself. <laughs> Thank you. Erica. Okay. Are you going to sit there? Okay. Very good. Okay, so um, I got into um, underwater bo uh, robots. Um, I started scuba diving when I was 12, um, and then I stuck with it. I actually became a working diver. I worked a little bit with NOAA and EPA. I have some photos of myself not in the slideshow, but I did wear a hard helmet, and I've done a lot of dry suit diving. Um, but I wanted to have a family. And so um, all the people that I worked with really encouraged me um, to stick with it. Um, so I sort of expressed an interest in some ROVs, and the rest is history. Um, so I was able to have a family and still go out to sea uh, while I was pregnant because I couldn't scuba dive. Um, so my kids, this is all they know, is mom and underwater robots. Um, this is how I got into it. So, um, and I've had the great pleasure of working with Edie, doing um, all kinds of education outreach and some programming and creation of ideas um, with students to encourage uh, more folks to think about marine technology and ways to explore. So this one. Okay, so ROVs, AUVs, and subs. Okay, so I'm gonna read from my notes here for this first part here. Okay, so we've been at this uh, ocean exploration kind of thing, figuring out how to do things under the sea um, for a really long time. This is about uh, 500 BC, uh, Hidna, where you may call her Sienna, and her dad, Sicilus, were under the sea vandalizing the Persian Navy um, during the Battle of Artesium all the way up to Klingert's diving machine, which was about 1797. Um, this first diving machine was tree trunks, tins, lookout glass. You were gone for, oh, you know, just a little while, but only about six meters. Um, and then we started with the Drebbel, which was conceptualized in about the 1500s. That's the top over here. But not built and used until about 1620, according to documentation. And then we started with Robert Fulton's invention of the Nautilus, which then, of course, led to Jules Verne and that 1870 tome that we all know, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. But uh, we kept on inventing and tinkering, researching, defending, designing. Um, but then there was this industry explosion when a lot of stuff happened in the, the 50s. It was post-World War II, oil and gas exploration took off, the United States Navy had its first nuclear-powered submarine, 
the Nautilus. And then, of course, there's that other man of imagination and creation, Disney, who also inspired by 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. In 1954, um, they created the, the ride there with the Nautilus. But um, so where are we now, though? We've had all this kind of stuff happen. Um, we are with all sorts of gadgets and gizmos and tech in the ocean. We have all different categories. And so the first one I want to talk about is AUVs. AUV stands for Autonomous Underwater Vehicle. This is the ocean-going vessel for the computer programming coder nerd, right? If you like the ocean, but you don't want to be out there, you get seasick, um, the AUV is your vehicle. So you can take it. Am I coming in and out? Oops. Sorry. So you can uh, take it into the lab. You can load it with all sorts of information, uh, programs for it to get the data that you want, depending on what you're studying. Um, you launch it onto a, the ship. The crew takes it out, launches it at the point that you want it to go in the ocean and find out its information. It does its little thing, and the end of the code line is literally s surface, call satellite, satellite calls you in the lab. You send the vessel back out to pick it up. So it's a workhorse. Um, it's pretty heavy. Um, it has a lot of power on board, uh, which is pretty new in ocean-going stuff. Typically, we don't put power on board something that's going to be submerged because batteries are off-gassing hydrogen and you get little explosions. So, um, so the next thing is um, sub-submersibles, submarines. Um, so there's Miss Edie herself in the middle. <laughs> I stole that off the internet. Uh, this is me uh, entering uh, Antipodes. That's my kids, uh, Antipodes on the surface. Um, there are plenty of tourist-type vessels and vehicles that you can do. Um, I just, I really recommend if you have any chance in your lifetime, don't pass it up to get inside a submersible. Go a little deeper than you might as a diver. See some things that you might not see as a diver because you're creating noise. A lot of these you can go and turn off lights and cameras and action and just let things come to you. It's a really amazing amazing experience. Um, and then the one on the far end over there, um, that is the submersible that James Cameron built um, to head to the Marianas Trench off the coast of Guam. Um, so it's really kind of cool um, because all of these things are designed for going in the ocean, but um, they're not fireproof, right? And they're made out of lots of foam and glass beads and all kinds of compressible stuff. So I have some friends that do some kind of sketchy stuff. And if you look right here, so if you'd like to ever touch something that went to the Marianas Trench, I brought it for <laughs> you. <to Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so they're obviously not missing it because it caught on fire and I had some friends cut it off and send it to me. So, um. All right, so what's next? Um, we have drifters. So drifters, um, a lot of times I hear other scientists call them about being the ocean trash. Um, if you put good information, um, good recorders, um, good satellite trackers on these. They shouldn't be ocean trash. We should all be responsible ocean scientists and go pick up what we've put out there. But drifters are these amazing little workhorses. They're very passive. They rely on the ocean currents. They rely on wind. They rely on wherever you put them to just drift, do their thing, and collect data. We know a lot about surface conditions, photosynthesis at the surface, uh, movement of red tides, um, chlorophyll present, based on the fact that these are just passively out there getting data and recording data, and sometimes you can actually get them to send data back. Mostly the programming for sending the data back is about calling you where their location is when they're about to die and their batteries are going to go, um, and then that way you can go pick them up. But because if you're a well-marked scientist, this is Florida over there, if you're a well-marked scientist and you keep your phone number and your uh, transmitters up to code, um, people will find them in the ocean and pick them up. And then they call you, because they have your phone number now, and then they say, well, I took it home. And then you're like, yes, I know you at home. It's in Daytona Beach, and I released that in Tampa Bay. It didn't go. <laughs> <laughs> so oftentimes it creates these funny maps, your gear, um, because it should have been drifting in the ocean the whole time. But once we said, I know where you are in Daytona Beach, if you could bring it back to Tampa Bay, that's the pink lines. It came back <laughs> and forth a couple of times. I assured him that I wanted our ocean trash back. So the next one is gliders. So gliders typically fall in the category of autonomous, right? They're not anybody inside them. They're not radioactively controlled, any of that kind of stuff. But they're a little different than the standard AUV because they don't really have power on board. They have tiny little motors, usually using um, hydro propulsion. So they maybe suck water in, push water out. They do these really long patterns. Um, they glide along that pattern. Um, they're able to take in tons and tons and tons of data. And then when they're done, you can bring them back up. 
and download that data and get your data set for really long-term events that have occurred out there in the ocean. Okay, but so my thing is ROVs, remotely operated vehicles. So they're all over the planet, all shapes and sizes from small like a bread box. I'm sure there's some people in here who know what a bread box is, right? <laughs> okay, <laughs> most of my college students don't. Um, to really large, about the size of like a minibus or a minivan. Um, but the cool thing is that they all have certain things in common. So just like every car has certain things fundamentally in common, right? They all have a motor and some tires and a steering wheel, but sometimes the car was 500 bucks and sometimes it was an awful lot more. So with ROVs, there's this fundamental sameness too. They all have structure. So structure can be as simple as this. Oops, sorry. Okay, structure could be as simple as this. Plastic coat hanger, a little bit more dynamic, something like this, PVC pipe. Um, but it could also be titanium. It depends on where you're going. It could be fiberglass. It's certainly not going to be wood or sponge, but you need some structure. Every ROV also has buoyancy or flotation. So usually it's glass beads, syntactic foam, things that are non-compressible at whatever depth you're headed to. Every ROV has motors or thrusters. Um, so I build these kits in my garage. And what I've done is I've taken bilge pump replacement cartridges from a boat, three of them, and I've taken off the propeller, or sorry, the impeller and put on a propeller. And so now I have them wired up to a tether. And so we'll clip them onto these uh, structures and float them in the pool. Every ROV also has power. Um, I still always use shore-based power. Um, I don't think you use anything that's submersible. There are quite a few small ROVs that do use onboard power because we're using things like lithium and other stuff that doesn't off-gas. Every ROV also has a mission or purpose. So if you take a look up there in the far corner, those two tiny ROVs were built with the very express purpose of exploring the inside of the Titanic. So um, many people know James Cameron as the filmmaker, but his brother is an engineer, and they have a little shop, and they built those two ROVs. So if you watch some of the uh, recordings of how they filmed the Titanic movie or the Into the Abyss documentary, um, you often hear them referring to the extra people on the vessel. Um, which is something that every ROV also has in common, and that's a name. And that's Jake and Elwood. So as you may recognize, <laughs> yes. So, yeah, so if you look for Jake and Elwood, it's actually the robots. But that's really common. Every ROV also has a name. Every ROV also has an umbilical or a tether and a pilot. So the umbilical or tether, let's see. Okay, um, so these are all the things that ROVs do on a daily basis. They work with divers. Um, this is a geothermal pool in Hawaii with a cave on it. That's my kids using a small video ray to enter underneath in the pool. Um, they work offshore and pass off tools. If you're a diver down there working, um, no reason to surface. You can actually send an ROV down with equipment. They collect stuff. They work offshore in oil rigs. But the limitation is that tether, right? So the cool thing about ROVs is they can do tons of stuff for a really long time. You don't have to bring them back to the surface. but this tether becomes a problem. You have to have somebody who's a tether manager. So um, I talk to my students a lot that you should stay in school and finish your degree in marine science or marine engineering um, because even if you're going to go out to sea, the last person you want to be is the person managing the tail on the robot all day long. So tether manager is a real job on a ship, but, um, but it's the, ve it's the ve vehicle to allow us to get information back to the surface. So, okay. So who's using ROVs and why are they using them and where is it going? Um, chance it's gonna work, you think? Probably. All right, let's see, next one. Hit it twice here. One. Nope. It's not gonna work. All right, that's okay. So, let me go back. Oh. All right, one more. This. Yeah. Okay. I made it work. Very good. Okay, so s about 1988, we started laying cables on the ocean floor using ROVs. So it starts up there. And So there's a little bit of work going on offshore while we all sleep at night. Okay, so the interesting thing is a lot of these are Google and um, Microsoft and, oh, I think it's a stop. I'm just gonna keep playing. Next one, okay. Um, 
so the cool thing is that a lot of times folks think that like you're getting all your data and information on your cell phone or your computer through some sort of satellite or magic juice that shoots across the sky. But quite often, um, all that information is coming through fiber optic cables that are on the ocean floor. So while there are folks who are using ROVs to lay some of that fiber optic cable, there are folks who are also trying to figure out how do I tap into that fiber optic cable and listen to the conversation or whatever is being transmitted, which could be banking information off the coast of Bermuda. It could be all sorts of things. So, um, however, there are other scientists who are working to find out ways to try and make, because obviously anything in the ocean is going to make noise, to make those cables quieter. Um, give it a second. All right. So this actually does happen too to ocean going cables. So this is an ROV pilot. Right. So, so yeah, undersea cables, um, your conversations make a lot of noise. They attract sharks. So there are outages sometimes with fiber optic cables due to sea life. Yeah, the shark swims off here. So even if you're just a lab person, but trying to figure out how to coat stuff and figure out how do we make all of these things silent so that we're not disturbing the ocean is an important work. Good. All right. Cool. Um, so also sometimes the ROV itself makes a lot of noise and gets in trouble. So. So these, these pictures are all, I have a lot of friends that work in oil and gas. Um, I interview a lot of women who work in oil and gas and talk about being ROV pilots. But so these are from o Oceaneering. Um, so an ROV stopped working on the ocean floor and it turns out there was a shark in the thruster. Um, but <laughs> this guy here, uh, Sailfish, uh, was caught in some underwater gear and an ROV pilot was able to go down and yank him out by the tail and the fish could swim away because some of this stuff is it uh, just has a couple of lights sometimes, and of course, with bioluminescence, it attracts sea life. Um, okay, so one more. So there's a shot from Edie's work. But the cool thing about the work that we do, hopefully this one doesn't make noise, is really discovering new critters, seeing what's out there, um, looking at stuff that Edie sees. So this little fish is only a couple of inches long. Um, it was discovered uh, by the folks who work at Mbari, which is the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Uh, Macropinna, this little fish, really has this cool canopy of a head, a uh, clear dome for its head, essentially. And the two round globular items um, are its eyeballs. The front sockets um, down below are where its nose is. So these have been seen in fishermen's nets, and they've been seen on the beaches, but they've never been seen alive. And so this video footage from Mbari is some of the first time that it was seen alive. So now there's scientists on the vessel talking to the ROV pilot. And this little critter, they're going to try and catch it. Right? I mean, it's, so t it's like as big as this remote. It's a tiny little guy. Hmm? Ah, it's Monterey Submarine Canyon, so probably five, 800 feet or more, maybe 1,000. Yeah, so this is an ROV pilot who is holding a cup underwater, essentially, to try and trap the little fish. Um, but this little guy, they've discovered, because of this video and some others like it, that they like to chase salps up and down the water column. So a salp is going to appear towards the top of the screen, and the fish sees that, and they can't close the jar in time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's like playing the most frustrating video game of your life. Um, <laughs> Um, but also, um, ROVs are in the news quite often. Uh, people hear about stuff out there, and I hear them always calling subs. But um, many of you may have heard the, the case of the Odyssey Marine Exploration, which is or was based in Tampa. Uh, they're doing some other work now, but they were the ones who found uh, the Spanish ship um, and all the gold coins on there, so treasure hunting. Um, this ROV over here in the top is quite often used by the Coast Guard, uh, the Marine Patrol, um, Homeland Security. It's a great flying camera, and so to remove um, officers and researchers um, or somebody who's going in to do a cleanup after a, a crash or something, to remove them from the situation um, so there's a little less trauma to the individual, oftentimes they'll send an ROV or a camera in to get data from whatever the accident was um, before they send a diver in to do recovery. Um, lots and lots of opportunity for collection. Um, and then now they are constantly being used 
um, in nuclear power plants and in the cooling tower. So that's that bottom picture there. So instead of sending any kind of person in, um, you can send an ROV in to get all the data you need. And usually with the manipulators, you can get the work done that needs to be repaired without actually draining the entire cooling tower. Um, but ROVs also help in outer space. So the largest body a body of water inside a building on the planet for a really long time was this body of water. This is the Neutral Buoyancy Lab in Houston, Texas. So every time that the International Space Station was being built and they put a piece in space, they put a piece in the pool. So I can't remember the scale, like one to 10 or something, but um, that pool, um, yeah, 50 million, 500 million, some gallons of water. Um, it's got all these windows down below, but the only way to train the astronauts about what they're doing, because they do have two safety divers, so that's a real job too, if you want to be a diver in a pool like this. Every astronaut has two safety divers their entire training career. Um, but all of the video feedback is done through ROVs, so there's always an ROV pilot um, on the deck at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. Um, really great, fun, safe place to fly to, no ocean currents, no critters, just astronauts. But it's, it's pretty fun to have something that's ocean going helping space because most of the other times it's been the other way back. Um, but the best job um, is this job, right? This is the ROV pilot. So many of us who are parents have probably said to some young person in our life, um, even if you weren't their parents, video games are going to lead nowhere. That's a lie. This is a great job if you have good hand-eye coordination, um, lots of uh, career opportunities offshore. Um, the current largest employer is still probably the oil and gas industry and then second with the military. Um, but one of the cool um, employers is Oceaneering. Um, and so a lot of their retired guys and gals who know a lot about working with water and electronics at the same time um, go to their office in Disney and Orlando area. So they are the also the largest uh, contract employer in the Orlando market because if you know how to work with water and electronics at the same time, you're a mastermind for all the rides that they all the rides that they have to maintain. Um, so a lot of people do a, a stint with oceaneering offshore and then go back inshore and live near Orlando. So, um, so this is Sean, who, my husband. Um, who Hercules is the ROV here, came into town and uh, we had an opportunity to go see the crew. Um, but it's a customized seat, uh, best video game chair you've ever played. Um, the uh, control system is usually designed to fit your arms and your hands and your fingers. Um, you get all these video monitors. The only bad part is that you usually have four to six scientists standing over your shoulder yelling, left, 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 no, get that, get that, get that. And um, so it's kind of a frustrating way to play a video game, but um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty interesting work. Um, and then over on the far side there, just to give you a little scale, so Hercules is, um, he's quite often now the video feed that's used um, if you're watching any like Nautilus Live, a series that comes out of Woods Hole, any of that video feed about what new stuff they're seeing in the ocean. It's been filmed lately with Hercules. Um, but just to give you an idea of size, so that's a manipulator. Um, there's Sean, I think, giving him a beer. Um, a big camera out there in the front. Um, so Hercules is pretty tall. I'd say probably a good eight or 10 feet um, tall and pretty wide. So um, these are all their control rooms of other ROV uh, vans on the ship. Um, it's always nice and cold in there. It's really beautiful. A lot of work. Um, so, this is me. If you're more of a land lover, I'm not really a land lover, but um, if you want to stay in the cage, stay on the deck, ROVs are your thing. Um, coat hanger is one of the ROVs that we'll do over at the pool. So, we will actually physically take this coat hanger, turn it upside down, add some flotation, add some movement, add an umbilical, some motors. And um, we will use this as our manipulator and collect things in the pool. This works really great. And then we'll upscale and actually build some really larger structures out of PVC pipe with the motor kits that I've built and wired up and brought to you guys. Um, and again, I've done this programming from the Arctic to Venezuela to Bermuda. I've had the opportunity to work with thousands of students and adults all over the planet. Um, it's really fun. I work with several offshore groups who want their entire marketing team or their sales team to understand all the terminology. Um, so it's really fun to get to work with those folks when they know when a customer calls and asks about a thruster, they know what a thruster is because we've had this opportunity to work with this gear. Um, so it's a really great activity. Um, I hope that you all come to the pool and, um, and build your own RV and fly around. And then I want to give a shout out really quickly. So um, the American Geophysical Union, uh, they just posted that they had some financial aid uh, available in the form of a personal grant to anybody who's doing educational outreach. So. 
Um, I wrote and asked, and so they funded all the kits. So everything I brought is staying here to go to the schools. So I'm very excited to see it. That's from AGU. So, so this is me, this is where I'm at. You can find me. Um, I now am the STEM director at a college. I've only been there about four years. I decided to get back into academia, but mostly I've been on my own with my small business and my outreach. So come build an RV, one more. There you go, questions. Oh, yes. So at the very beginning of your presentation, you mm -hmm. said if you have the opportunity to go on a submersible, you should. Yeah. Can you provide some suggestions as to how <laughs> we can make that happen? <laughs> <laughs> there's there's Roatan. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's, there's a couple in Roatan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, if you, where can you, where can I get on a, a submersible? So yeah, there's Roatan, uh, Costa Rica. Um, I think there's a couple in Hawaii. Um, yeah, there's there's quite a few around. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I have to put in a plug. So, um, Orca, which is my organization, has, is going to have a raffle in February that is, includes uh, a submersible guide. So, if you want to buy me a ticket, where? So, yep, so um, yep. <coughs> teamorca.org, that's EDU's organization. Um, in February, they have a raffle for submersible it's ride. Actually a, it's a, a silent, silent, silent auction. Silent auction. Okay. Bit high, bit high. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Any more questions? <laughs> Any other questions? There's constant maintenance, but the, uh, the other really cool thing is is that um, Google particularly um, has turned over a lot of their cables that are no longer used, um, and they allow um, data transmission to still happen for seismic ocean floor monitoring. So a lot of the stuff that we now know about the ocean floor and volcanic or movement activity of plates um, and seismic activity um, has been happening because of these cables now. Yeah, but they don't, they usually don't go back and pick them up, but they do put new stuff down. Where do I think the future's going with new ROV technology? I think the future is, um, it's there about trying to figure out how we can cut the cord, right? Um, I can send you a picture from the moon to your cell phone, um, but water is thicker than air, and we still really haven't figured out how to get that instantaneous data and feedback um, through the ocean water. So I think the ability to cut the cord. There's a few organizations, I've seen some talks um, by the military, um, quite a few years ago, they were working on something called green laser technology to get some movement. There are people who are trying to use sound to get things to move, but the ability to really reach out, grab something, put it in a drawer, or take a picture and bring something back right away, or listen to something and bring it back right away. Um, it's still not there yet in that same kind of um, So the average depth for ROVs, it kind of depends on the work, right? Everything is very mission specific. So if it's just in the pool, it's you know 50 feet or 100 feet when in uh, the NASA pool. Um, if it's in the ocean, a lot of stuff is beyond that casual diver depth, so just over 100 feet. Um, yeah, a lot of s we do. A lot in f I'm in Florida, so a lot of springs and that kind of in yeah, yeah. A lot of those are endlessly deep. Yeah. Yeah, NOAA's got a great uh, ocean exploration advisory board, so a really great organization. So, yeah, NOAA actually sends out uh, in the states um, some really cool curriculum guides and then standards for classrooms so that everybody is speaking the same language. So that's a big part of my talk is talking about the difference between, because I, I hate watching the news and somebody saying it was a sub and there was no people inside. It was an AUV or a glider or an ROV. I think it's really important to differentiate between the technology so we all know what's out there and where we can go from there. And if you're looking for more information, which tech you need to reach out for. And there's a lot of great schools and universities across the planet um, that are doing this type of work. I even gave a presentation to online to Vladivostok University in Russia this summer, so for students who are interested in marine engineering. So. Very cool. I know I'm holding you from dinner, so let's go. Eat. All <laughs> Thank right, you. guys. Food. Oh,
Right, so you get voltage drop, right? Pressure, depth, you get voltage drop. It depends on how much juice you can send down the line to power up all the things you have. So the bigger the ROV, the more lights and camera in action. And so um, you need to be able to have a lot of power to send down the line. But um, for me, what I've done is I'm using an 18.6 cable. Um, and so I can give you 100 feet of depth on 12 volts. All mm -hmm. right, guys, let's give a big thank you to Erica Moulton. So also a huge thank you to Brigadoon for uh, letting us use their venue tonight. It was awesome. Uh, yeah, big round of applause. Now the night is not over. We have some dinner being served here at Brigadoon, but we need to redo this entire room because this was a restaurant turned into a presentation room. We need to turn it back into a restaurant. So if you guys wouldn't mind just heading out for a little bit uh, and while we are resetting up everything and then if you're staying for dinner you will come back in all right so thank you guys so much for coming out and we'll see you in just two days or maybe tomorrow building an rov with erica <laughs>